Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Nevada Housing Coalition Lunch and Learn series. Um, as a reminder, the session is being recorded, and if you're just joining us, please put your name and organization in the chat. If you have any questions, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A box, which we'll be monitoring. If this is your first Lunch and Learn with us, welcome, and we thank you for joining us. And for those of you who have attended in the past, welcome back. I'm Amanda Lakin. I'm the Communications and Outreach Coordinator for the Nevada Housing Coalition. And if you don't already know what we do, we are a member-based nonprofit working to ensure housing options for all Nevadans. And we do this through three strategic priorities, advocacy, collaboration, and education. And these Lunch and Learns are part of our educational platform, and we hold them virtually on the fourth Wednesday of every month from 12 to 12.45. If you aren't already a member of the coalition, we invite you to learn more about how your membership can make an impact on the housing crisis in Nevada. We have a variety of membership levels as well as scholarships available, and we will drop a link in the chat for you to learn more. And today I'm very pleased to announce that Brooke Page is going to be moderating this session. Brooke is the Director Southwest for Corporation for Supportive Housing, and she's also one of our newest Board of Director members for the Nevada Housing Coalition. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and thank you to Christine and to the rest of the board of directors for the Nevada Housing Coalition uh, for hosting this discussion today on the innovations and the opportunities to maximize our community resources by considering adaptive resource, uh, reuse as an option for expanding our affordable housing footprint in Nevada. Um, I am really excited to be representing the board today um, as well as CSH on this topic. Uh, I am joined today with our colleagues from the field, Stephen Kuncher, Director of Housing Development, and Andrew Chaffin, who is also with uh, a senior housing developer, both with Maker Housing Partners. Um, we also have Matthew Fleming joining us today, the Executive Director for Northern Nevada Community Housing, and David Human, who is the Program Associate with Enterprise Community Development Partners. They're going to help us frame and discuss this topic in more depth. I thank you all so much for your perspectives and your insights. Um, you know, in Nevada, there is a great need, um, as us, all of you know uh, on this call, um, for affordable housing across the state. Um, there is a gentleman by the name of Carl Elefante, um, who is the president with um, AIA, and he's quoted saying, simply occupying every floor of every existing building would absorb years of demand for growth and for revitalization across all of our neighborhoods. Um, you know, just the concept of maximizing our existing space. Uh, last week, I actually had the opportunity to facilitate a national discussion on the opportunities to convert hotels and motels into permanent housing options for people who are unhoused. Um, and so today, very similarly, we're discussing adaptive reuse or the process of reusing an existing building for the purpose other than what it was originally designed or intended for. Um, so this is definitely an attractive alternative to new construction. Um, so during the hotel motel conversation that we had last week, a key takeaway included the need to really obtain community buy-in um, and the political will for local elected officials and for the community around these developments um, really to get their buy-in and get educated and, and, and really understand early on the benefits and the importance of, of uh, reusing our existing resources. Um, and so during today's discussion, uh, we have the examples again from two communities that we have uh, addressed this issue are doing adaptive reuse. And so we will highlight how their projects have started um, discuss some of the challenges and the opportunities that they experience in their communities um, to see if there's maybe some innovation that you all can think about for, for your communities. And then we're going to close out with Enterprise Community Partners um, that's going to give us that national adaptive reuse best practice and what they're seeing nationally. Um, and so we welcome you, though, as our audience to engage with us, put your questions in the chat, um, and, and really, you know, use this as a learning opportunity to figure out how, how we can scale this intervention throughout um, Nevada. So without further ado, let's get started. And, and I'm going to invite Stephen and Andrew uh, to kick us off. Great. Thank you, Brooke. Good afternoon. And thanks, everyone, for having us today. We're very thrilled to be sharing um, our experience on this project. And hopefully it'll inspire others for similar projects in the future. 
Um, just to give a quick uh, kind of reference context for who we are, Maker Housing Partners is the housing authority for Adams County. We're the county directly to the north of Denver. Um, we're the third largest county in the state and so, and growing quickly. Um, and we have a very diverse um, communities really from north to south. We've seen a lot of new growth in, in the northern part furthest from Denver and a lot of, uh, a lot of infill projects in our southern side. Um, and to give you some uh, um, quick background on this project, um, we've been for years working with um, closely with Adams County staff and the commissioners to try to expand affordable housing opportunities throughout Adams County and um, exploring any potential uh, sites that the county owned to, to build on. This site presented uh, itself because back in uh, 2016, the county had started construction on a new human services center, consolidating multiple sites throughout the county into one uh, large uh, one-stop shop for, for human services in the county. So they had uh, multiple office buildings that they were uh, vacating. And so we, we worked with them and took a look at each site. And this one uh, looked to be a really good fit for housing. Uh, you can see from the aerial photo there, there's single family homes to the north and south. Um, there's an existing four-story office building. Uh, that was their children and family services division. And then uh, behind in the 4.7 acre site, there's a large parking lot and some open space uh, as well to the west. Um, the next thing we did is we started to um, formulate some plans and some ideas for the site. Uh, Housing Colorado has a great charrette program, design charrette program, and we joined that program with this site and we're able to come up with an idea. That really put forth the vision that we were able to present to the county commissioners uh, to see what could be possible at this, at this site. From there, we applied in 2019 for uh, 4% as well as Colorado State Housing Tax Credits. Uh, we were awarded tax credits. We began construction in July of 2020, and the project was just completed in November of uh, last year. So this is the plan um, that we came up with coming out of that charrette, working with a local architect firm. Uh, as you can see, the um, parking lot is drastically changed. And not only did we convert the office building, we were uh, also able to add four new construction buildings to the back, uh, adding uh, for a total of 116 units. So the front building is about a little over 40,000 square foot office. And because of the floor plan, we uh, were able to get 44 one bedroom or 41 bedrooms and four two bedrooms uh, there. And that also houses all the indoor amenities and the leasing office. Uh, and then the four walk-up buildings, three-story walk-ups to, uh, to what would be the West um, are uh, 72 total units. Um, mostly twos and threes. Um, let's see. And one thing to note there is uh, what one of the things we want to accomplish in going to the west where it starts to go up the hill is maintain the height of the existing building uh, given the single story homes surrounding the, the community. Exactly, which definitely helped in our neighborhood uh, public meetings uh, to help them get over the fear of you know, imagining giant towers looming over their backyards. We could assure them that we would kind of maintain that height uh, with the existing building, one that they, you know, have been used to since 1983. So that definitely helped uh, in, in that process as well. Uh, just, you know, a, a more overview in that front building, we have the indoor amenities for the community, which include a fitness room, computer station, conference room, uh, uh, community room, as well as a multi-purpose room. And then you can see that one corner we peeled back to create a rooftop patio. Since the walk-ups, you can see in the courtyard, 
uh, images do most of two thirds of the units have patios or, or balconies. Um, the rooftop patio was our way of trying to get that uh, private out, semi-private outdoor space for the front building. Uh, and then in that courtyard coming off the building that you know, hopefully ties or, or, or desire, the desire will tie the community together, uh, have two little tot lots. Uh, in the center area is a barbecue area with two gas grills, as well as a gas fireplace, uh, raised bed gardens, and an, a fenced in dog run. This is for our area, for our county. This is our AMIs and levels um, for a two person household and a four person household. Most of our units are 50 and 70%. We do have 12, four at 40, and eight at 30. Um, those are targeting the, our partnership with Children and Family Services. Um, actually, I don't, yeah, I don't know if we mentioned that yet. Because the, the old Human Service Building uh, had the Children and Family Service in there. Uh, department in there, we um, reached out to them at, about a, a possible partnership uh, to provide housing for uh, youth transitioning out of uh, foster care, which, uh, you know, if you don't know, is a huge issue. Um, I've read up to 50% of youth uh, experience homelessness after leaving the system uh, at one point or another. So providing stable housing, quality housing, um, was, is, a, is a big deal. And so we've been able to form that partnership. And so those 12 units, uh, we try to, uh, we have set aside or give preference to the Children Family Services uh, to fill those first. And um, yeah, and then you can see, and then the rest are split between 50 and 70. So that was new for us. It's the first uh, average income uh, tax credit part project that we've, we've done. And so, um, that's why we, we were able uh, to, to uh, provide those units uh, to the youth um, as, as part of the mix. And then, so our approach, we have a picture of it uh, under construction, uh, a drone photo. Uh, the total development cost was 42 million. Um, and so you can see the sources were shy of 20 million in, in tax credit equity between the 4% and the state tax credit combined. Uh, we also have a local a state housing development grant, uh, some county federal funds and home and CDBG. Uh, our perm loan is Freddie Tell, the tax exempt loan, and then uh, maker contribution um, is, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember, I'm blanking on our contribution. The combination of uh, deferred finished. developer fee that's it. Deferred to the yeah, like, yeah. where did that number? And then a, a small uh, owner loan, deferred developer fee, <laughs> mental play. Um, so then you can see the total cost, uh, hard costs, 30 million land costs. Uh, again, that was donated by the county. So that was huge. That really helped us add a lot of amenities and, and, and uh, um, as well as do underground uh, stormwater bolts, um, which is one of the cons coming up later. Uh, then you got your finance, financing costs and soft costs and our, and our developer fee round out the, the total development costs. And so here's some quick uh, adaptive reuse pros and cons, you know, things to consider. Um, you know, uh, some of the pros, like we already mentioned, the existing building height. You can see the front building uh, in that top image off to the left. And then we were able to put three-story buildings to kind of come off and match that. Um, and so that was a huge pro, having something already there to help the, the neighbors understand uh, kind of what we're proposing and, and, and talking about. Um, this site has about 25 foot grade drop from west going down to east in front of the existing building. That, existing building catches about 12 feet of that grade. And so it's actually four stories in the front and three stories in the back. And so by preserving the building that saved uh, significant grading uh, costs, regrading um, and site work, excavating, all that good stuff. The same with demo savings. We did have to demo the existing building down to its core, but uh, the core turned out to be in great shape. So we have a concrete core and shell that we were able to reuse. Um, and so because of that, there was a shorter schedule with that. You know, we, we saved 
um, we were able to start the construction on the front building while they're doing the site work on the back side. And so, you know, if you take that savings in just for the front building by itself, uh, you know, probably save four to six weeks um, by not having to do all the earthwork uh, around that site. Now, some of the cons, uh, you know, again, with any rehab or re reuse, it's always a, a question mark, the quality of what's, what's existing. Uh, because of the front building was concrete, that pushed a, a more expensive construction type, you know, instead of a type five wood frame, um, stick built walk-ups like we did in the back, uh, this was a type one, you know, concrete with steel uh, framing. Um, and then given the existing location of the building, uh, you know, back in good garden suburban development, you know, set back off of the street significantly, um, got limited where we could put uh, stormwater vault and treatment. And so uh, in order to maximize the site and reduce uh, and to get the most units possible, we that pushed us towards underground storm bolts, which you can see there in that bottom left picture. Um, so that did add costs as well. So, you know, working with a fixed building does push you to do certain things you wouldn't normally do if you're starting with a, with a blank slate. But overall, it was a great experience. The cost, you know, given these things, it's really hard to pencil out exactly the savings and, and the extra costs. Um, you know, just given the different approaches, but uh, I wouldn't say it was a huge savings. Uh, you know, I would say probably conservatively, it was a push. Um, given that it was good quality core and shell, didn't require a lot of extra work. Um, you know, the savings with the demo uh, and and the grading and the and the schedule, um, I think, made up for any additional costs that uh, that came from the construction type and the, and the storm bolts. Know, Steve, would you add anything to that? Um, no, I would I would agree with that, and um, just say you know, it's great to also be able to preserve, you know, part of the community, even though it's not a historic building or anything to that nature. Um, we were able to at least reuse, and um, you know, we like that approach and from the sustainability and preservation perspective as well. Well, thanks everybody. That's our our project. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. We're going to hold questions. Um, we, has, we have some questions coming in through the Q&A, which is uh, preferred. Thank you all so much for sending those in. We're now going to shift and we're going to hear from Matthew uh, regarding our, our northern Nevada work. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, happy Wednesday. Let's see here. Here we go. Let's see here. You guys see that? Yep, looks good. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Fleming. I'm the Executive Director of Northern Nevada Community Housing, and I'm here to present the El Centro Project. This is definitely a, a historical site. It's part of our registry here in downtown Reno, and it was originally built in 1958, this is what it looked like. It was called the El Centro Motel. You can even see the cool little old cars in the background. Uh, again, built in 1958 as a hotel. Our organization purchased this from the next owner, which was called Joseph in 1994. And this is where we uh, started the conversion of turning it in from a hotel to permanent housing. The problem was back in that time, we didn't have all the funding mechanisms that we do now. So there was very limited rehabilitation that was attached to this project, really affecting the quality of life for the people that live there. Um, no kitchenettes, no ADA, uh, access and, and code uh, requirements, it, it really became dilapidated and a very tired building over time. Our organization purchased it in 1994 and made it um, 
with a partnership through the Reno Housing Authority, a building to house chronically homeless individuals. So as we go through the process of owning this building for a few years, we start to get uh, into some trouble to sort of speak with the housing authority because our quality of life standards were not meeting the, the basic standards of what um, their inspectors, their, their requirements are. So we realized this building has got to go through a full, full rehab, make it code uh, compliant when it comes to ADA, when it comes to uh, energy efficiency, and then just repackage this building to last another hundred years. So uh, it took us quite a long time to figure out the, the funding sources and the packaging, but what we found was this program through, the, uh, through HUD called the RAD program. You know, they love their acronyms, um, but it's basically when you're going to do a rehab for an affordable development, you can gain access to these project-based vouchers that will help pay for the rents for these chronically homeless clients. So we packaged all of these funding together to start the rehab of Joseph's Inn. And one of the things that we ran into right away was the fact that this was part of the historical registry. We had to get um, the sign off from the Nevada State His Historical Preservation uh, Group. And so they were just absolutely ecstatic to find out that we're going to revert the name its character and its style back to the original 1958 El Centro Hotel, but we're going to make it all modern. You just wouldn't know it from the outside. You would just think somebody built a, a building the same way they would have done it in the 50s, but it's not. It, is, it, it has the look, but it is no longer um, built in, in a way that uh, it, it, it preserves its historical character. Sorry, I'm fumbling on my words today. If you look at, you can see the uh, solar panel array there um, on top. So we have renewable energies, all, uh, all of the utilities are included in the rent. This helps with uh, retention with, the, with these clients and we're just removes another barrier of complexity for them so that they can maintain their housing. There's 26 units. And as you can see now, we have split face uh, AC and, and adapting units, whereas before it was those horrible, what we call wall bangers, those AC and heating units uh, out, outside the, the wall. It, it just looks terrible from the outside, but it's just an old hangover from the way they used to build hotels back in the day. And, now we have a kitchen, whereas before these clients never had a kitchen. The best we could do back then was give them a small fridge and a hot plate. And they didn't have their own TV. They didn't have any of the amenities that they have now. Um, so they'll have this television with free um, Netflix and free Hulu and, and streaming. They'll have free Wi-Fi and uh, the rent is paid for through the RAD program. What we require from our tenants is that they go through the wrap, um, wraparound case management through our partnerships with the Veterans Administration as well as Northern Nevada Hopes. But you can see it, this turned into a beautiful, absolutely gorgeous facility that when these folks returned, from their relocation while we were doing the build, they, they were absolutely blown away. Um, so many people cried, uh, couldn't believe that they were allowed to live in a facility like this, that, that we took the time and the effort to um, be respectful to its historical preservation and to frankly add amenities that were never there this parking lot down at the bottom has been converted into a garden. And on the back side of the building, we added a outdoor garden and smoking area for the tenants. But if you just 
just as an example, this sign, which is just to me the coolest thing. It, this project was so much fun because we got to do things that were cool like this and, and recreate the actual historical sign. But all of this is not neon. This is all LED, um, highly ener energy efficient, um, gonna last forever. And, and it, it's just so neat to see how uh, we were able to preserve its historical and, and return it to its historical character, but then add all of these new, up-to-date, modern, innovative, very cool design features. The project itself uh, took 4.5 million in 9% light tech uh, investment. Uh, we did that through Raymond James. There's 1.2 million approximately in national housing trust funds. Those were uh, awarded to us through the state of Nevada. We have are carrying a $400,000 permanent finance loan on it. We had reinvested roughly 330,000 in the original home funds that were on the project back in 1994. And we added 260,000 in AHP funds, being that we are serving chronically homeless veterans. Um, we, we, were, we were a sure win on that application. And, and that's it, that's, that's the El Centro project. You get to see, uh, when you go to this building now, you get to walk through the historical um, kind of storyboards that we have throughout the building where it, it talks about its history. Um, we show these postcards and other elements uh, throughout the building as artwork just to give a little extra touch and a little uh, final bit of respect to um, its original uh, building. So that, that is El Centro. And we believe in repurposing um, projects like this. It's, it, it, here in Reno, we have such an inventory of dilapidated, rundown, small hotels like this that the neighbors would absolutely love to have us come in and either uh, repurpose and reuse them or tear them down and, and build something new. But for this purpose, we're talking about reuse and our organization believes in reuse, uh, not only for old hotels, but also we did a project a few years back where we converted like this previous group, a commercial building into affordable housing for chronically homeless veterans as well. So um, we here in Northern Nevada are available to answer any questions. Um, we're available to any other developer who wants to learn uh, the pros and cons of, of doing this kind of uh, development, but I think it was fun. I think it was uh, an, an honor and, and a pleasure to, to serve our community in, in this way. And there's the El Centro project. Thank you for your time. Wow. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, you were getting both, both projects um, between Stephen and Andrew and Matthew, you all are getting some really great feedback in the chat. Thank you so much. What beautiful features <clears throat> and the diversity of the folks that you all are serving through these um, developments are very inspiring. Um, and we've got some questions that are coming in in the Q&A that we would like to, to raise. <clears throat> so we're going to ask all of our panelists to come forward. Um, and we're going to start actually with, um, with you, Matthew, in, in talking about how does all include all in construction costs um, without land compare to building on a vacant lot given assumptions of costs at the time of construction. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's always gonna be site specific. Um, so it all depends what was built there before. And, and that's why we have to get a cost analysis um, right out the gate just to see the level of rehab or any uh, conversion that we could do, what would that cost compared to, to doing it on flat ground? And I find that a project like what we built was actually pretty expensive. Um, and that's because we're preserving something and trying to uh, deal with 
50 plus years of difference in codes and building and so on. So I'm running on with this answer. I'm going to say that's a complicated question. Um, it, it really is site specific. And, and I would just say that we prefer to do new construction for the most part. Um, but these conversion, these reuse um, projects are important because you need to, to, to use the existing inventory that's there. We need what's closest to the service providers, what's best for the client base to gain access to uh, their, their service providers and what helps them sustain their life. Um, so I know that didn't really answer your question directly. I kind of answered it like a politician, but it's the truth. I, it, it, it's very site specific and sometimes you get lucky and, and it's, you're saving more money, but then sometimes you don't, you kind of got to know what the, what, what's behind the, the veil. Uh, so when you get in the walls, when you start opening up the building, see how it was originally built, see how it was maintained, then you'll have a good idea as to whether or not you're going to save any money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I wondering, um, Andrew and Stephen, do you think that that's pretty consistent with, with your experience? Yeah, and actually, I just brought up one of our earlier estimates that kind of broke it down between the um, new construction and the reuse. And so you can see, um, can you see my yeah. cursor moving as well? Mm -hmm. So this is the walk-up summary total at this time, you know, this was halfway through DD, um, you know, we didn't end up too much far off of this, uh, but you can see the walk-ups were about 170 cost per square foot and the tower because of the construction type was 193, also less square footage, right? You know, we have 40 units as opposed to 72 units, uh, higher finishes, steel framing, things like that drove the costs up, but the site work, right? There was a lot less site work for this building. You know, we didn't have to over X. Our soils here in Colorado are terrible. So our geotech always has us over X 10 feet. You know, there's costs there, schedule impact there. So, you know, a lot of this site work was pre preparing, you know, for the walk up. So again, this is where, you know, I mentioned before, it's kind of a push. It's hard to really say, did we save money? Did we lose money? In the end, it really seems like it was a push. You know, it's not, we don't do this because it's a, it's a huge way to save a lot of costs in construction. Um, I think the, there's a lot of other benefits and in, intangibles in, in that make it worth pursuing. But, um, you know, as far as already being established in the neighborhood, um, you know, reducing the waste into the, in, in the landfill and the environment, you know, things like that, uh, some schedule savings, some GC savings, things like that. There are some savings, there are some value and benefits, but as far as, at least in our project, and this was kind of consistent, you know, our uh, contractor um, did a, uh, we hired them because they also did a project for a neighboring uh, housing authority here, and it was consistent that, adaptive reuse part was a little bit higher cost total and then they did a new build next to it you know again it's type five stick frame it, that's a little bit at the time was cheaper obviously <laughs> with lumber going crazy this summer who knows we might be doing everything in steel but uh, at the time you know two three years ago um yeah that's it, it still it was a little bit more expensive between those two projects you know same builder um but again that project was eight stories in a, in a neighborhood that has since been rezoned and they couldn't go above six. So they chose to keep that building to keep that extra height. Um, so. Really great explanation. Thank you both so much. Um, we have some specific questions. A lot of great questions are coming in. We might have to take some of these offline, but um, Matthew, does El Centro have closets? Uh, is there closet space built in to those units? Yes, there is. <laughs> All right, great. And then as far as the supportive services, are they required? Are they available um, for the residents on, on an as-needed basis? So it, it's client-driven. Uh, if, if a client comes in through the VA, then they'll, they will have their wraparound case management. It's not a requirement. This would be considered a housing first model if you were to try to define this project. 
All right, so we've got a question um, for both projects. And what benefits did the local government provide you all um, to sort of either expedite the adaptive reuse or kind of relax some policies? Was there anything special that, that local funders did? You know, for our project, um, really it was the donation of the site. Beyond that, you know, we had unanimous support from the county commissioners. Um, however, we still had to follow the, the, the standard processes. We had to go through a rezone, um, our building permit process. All of those processes were still the same. They also provided some um, grant funding and private activity bonds for the project. Um, we didn't see any waivers of permit fees or anything like that. Fortunately, the county does not have a use tax, so that saved us a few hundred thousand there. Um, but really, it was, it was the land, the donations, the grant funds, bonds, and their general support, which really pushed the project through, especially uh, with our uh, housing and finance authority. Thank you. Matthew, how about you? Was there any... Uh, Relaxed we, we, we had just tons of support from everybody, from every jurisdiction, from the local all the way to the federal. Um, I would say the biggest key factor to this project uh, was getting those uh, national housing trust funds from from the state of Nevada that that really helped this um gap get filled and and get us to to the place where we knew we could actually deliver this product so we i i have nothing i don't normally get to praise our jurisdictions like this so i'm just gonna say it one more time they all of them were amazing and very helpful in every way they could awesome um and some consistent questions that i have coming in is are there more of these projects happening in Reno and Northern Nevada? Are you all considering doing more of these types of developments? Well, we are. Um, it's, it's all about inventory and money. <laughs> uh, we have the capacity. We could do one, two, three of these every year if we had inventory and financial capacity. So that's all we're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciate this robust conversation. There are some phenomenal questions that are still needing to be answered. So maybe we can uh, loop back around and, and get those out to everybody um, once we uh, finalize our presentation today. Um, but we have our next guest is ready to present, David, uh, with Enterprise Community Partners and kind of give us uh, some information on the national landscape of this topic. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you guys so much and uh, appreciate you guys inviting me to join today. As Brooke mentioned, I'm uh, part of Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, we focus on you know, increasing the housing supply, advancing racial equity and, and building resilience and upward mobility. I'm a part of the, the consulting arm around that, which is the solutions uh, enterprise advisors on the equitable housing solutions team. Uh, so adaptive reuse, we sort of talked about it. I think, all right, broadly, we're looking to convert underutilized spaces to make it more productive uses. Um, today's conversation is focused around housing, but it can uh, target a few different things. On a national level, uh, the economic trends that sort of pour toward, point towards more adaptive reuse projects, uh, where we've been seeing an increase in commercial and vacant spaces, a change in consumer patterns, um, looking for solutions that focus on revitalizing downtown areas or specific community areas that are transformative and bring in activities such as walkability, uh, and then also that rise in construction costs. In some instances, acquisition and conversion is more cost effective than new construction. Uh, as I mentioned, these are more national trends. It really varies on, on the local level. Uh, and so, right, I think it's definitely worth the effort to understanding, you know, what your inventory is for community commercial spaces, how consumer patterns change, understanding the construction costs around that, and also uh, targeting um, areas within their community that, that are sort of primed for this revitalization effort itself. Uh, adaptive reuse has some key barriers that may run into it if a local community or local government hasn't been through the process before or haven't looked at sort of addressing, you know, what are those key barriers? Uh, and some of that is a zoning. Um, zoning can be very limiting uh, when we are talking about 
um, old zoning codes uh, that separate urban from commercial uh, instead of sort of a mixed use or free forming uh, sort of form based code approach. On parking, parking can also be um, uh, a key barrier when there's a misalignment or there's not flexibility around that. Uh, and there's also could be community pushback if there's a misconception versus what is needed versus what is being demanded uh, for parking requirements itself as well. On the financing side, if we're targeting areas that have um, you know, weaker market or lower rent levels, uh, there's a need to make up in that uh, in terms of financial tools. And because these are sometimes a new process in communities, there's some risk aversion for lenders. Uh, and sometimes the incentives that are offered, such as property tax release, uh, are not to scale um, with the sort of the financial gap or feasibility gap to developing that project. And then in some communities who haven't gone through the acquisition process so far or donated land for these types of efforts, there could be some uh, uncertainty around that as well. Uh, they, we had some previous panelists speak about the codes and how it could be constringent in terms of setback um, or unfit for challenging uh, uh, building types. And so that might be some ways to uh, uh, create barriers for it. In terms of solutions, we've seen uh, a few different approaches that local communities have taken. Uh, they've looked at uh, developing an inventory of their existing reuse opportunities. So what commercial spaces are out there? What are some potential uses for it? And really mapping it out and seeing where those greater opportunities lie. Um, they've looked at recalibrating their parking requirements over time as well to see where they can increase that flexibility and sort of address uh, some of the challenges in their existing code as well. Um, this can be a very technical process if you're looking to uh, increase um, the financial incentives that you're looking to uh, apply for, whether it's state or local uh, funding sources. Uh, and so technical assistance um, can not only improve the process, but streamline it as well when you have all departments sort of working on the same page. Uh, and I think one of the biggest recommendations is updating zoning codes. I've seen local governments when when they've updated their zoning codes with the use uh, with the idea to promote adaptive reuse, they have really pushed forward um, a change in their communities. Uh, there were two case studies that I wanted to go through and walk through with you all today, but uh, because of time, I'll just sort of do a quick touch base on where the affordable housing component goes into it. The city of Los Angeles has their adaptive reuse ordinance. Uh, and in recent years, uh, they're looking to expand their areas where it's already being implemented uh, into more moderate income households, uh, making them deed restricted uh, between the 80% to 120% AMI level. Uh, and their successes have um, gained support from on the state level as well through rehabilitation uh, tax credits. The other case study is around Baltimore. Uh, they updated their zoning code through Transform Baltimore. Uh, looking at wavering parking requirements, uh, creating those flexible zoning districts uh, based on building type, and also compiling a database around building energy code solutions that they saw rise around their special housing type that they have in the, their community. Um, they work closely with the state financing agencies uh, to refine tools uh, to make them compatible with some of their programs um, and also requiring a commitment for affordable and workforce housing as well. And so really adaptive reuse can be uh, supported on all levels of government in all levels of the community. Um, and there's ways for it to, to work and intermingle um, when everyone's sort of working on the same stride. And so I know I'm at time, so I will pass it back to Brooke uh, to lead us through the next part. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Really great information, great case studies to present. We thank you all so much. Um, Christine, did you want to close us out or anything we want to do for housekeeping? I appreciate you helping us navigate the chat. Um, and Amanda, navigating the links. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thanks everybody for your time today. And I just want to close you out next uh, Lunch and Learn. I just a huge shout out. If we were in person, by the way, I would give you all an applause. Matthew, Andrew, Stephen, I'm going to be sending you some follow up questions and yes, we're going to get you the slides in a PDF form. So uh, we'll forward that out as well as a recording of all this wonderful information and especially those cases that David brought forward. I really appreciate my partners at Enterprise and their technical expertise. But our next Lunch and Learn will be at the fourth Wednesday of March. And we'll be featuring the Nevada Housing Division, of course, who last year presented the annual housing progress report. And I've asked uh, Betsy 
our amazing economist at the housing division to also focus on the different income levels and what she's seeing in our inventory. We'll also be bringing forward the National Low Income Housing Coalition in advance of the 2022 or 2021, look, looking back at last year, their GAP report. Uh, their research team is going to come on and just share some insights into Nevada's, uh, Nevada's affordable housing shortage. And my phone's been blowing up. I don't know if yours has, but I also just want to announce that today in the governor's state of the state address, uh, the governor committed is committing, obviously we have to go through a process in our interim finance committee, but of our American Rescue Plan Act funds, the governor has announced $500 million for affordable housing. So super amazing. Uh, we are so grateful to the governor. You can find more information here. I just went online now. I have not heard the speech. I'll have to go back and listen myself because I was listening, listening to our awesome uh, speakers. But I'll pop this into the chat here for everybody. And you can see um, about the initiative that the governor has called Home Means Nevada. So um, lots happening for affordable housing. So Matthew, you said more funding. There you go. <laughs> I think we have some opportunities, certainly in Northern Nevada and Southern Nevada. So um, really want to thank you, Stephen and Andrew. I just want to say that affordable housing, our community is awesome. And I really appreciate your share with Nevada. We love Colorado, of course, as a fellow Western state. And thanks for your hard work at the Housing Authority doing some truly innovative work. Thank you for being with us. That's it, Brooke. Yay. Great news. And so then a high see, note. Woo, I know we're going to end on a high note and uh, super exciting. Thank you all. And we'll see you next month.